Okay. So, um, maybe as you saw the other day, when I rec I'll record the what goes on in class, and then I'll put it in that day's folder. I sent out a note saying it was there. <coughs> sometimes I'll do that. Sometimes it may come a little bit later. Um, so if you wanted to go back, if you zoned out or something didn't quite make sense, you can go back and take a look at it. If it still doesn't make sense, email me or come and see me. All right, so questions about today's topics, which were intermolecular forces, polarity. Is there, is there a tendency towards the boiling point to be more affected by dipole dipole because, uh, comparatively to uh, hydrogen bonding? Because one of the questions was a little bit confusing where I thought that it was going to be a, a hydrogen bond compared to a, over a dipole dipole. Or maybe it was just the charts that was in it. And that was a little bit confusing because I, I didn't think that there would be a discrepancy on the boiling point versus the melting point. So which, so which, do you remember which problem it was? It's, it's actually not even one of those charts. Oh. That's on the cutoff. With the boiling points. Yeah. Versus the melting points. There's just a little bit. Yeah. Confusing. Well, I mean, if you think about the, f the physical property of a boiling point versus a melting point, it takes a lot more energy to vaporize the molecule to take it from the liquid to the gas phase versus melting, which is just a phenomenon where the molecules slide past each other. So the hydrogen bond then probably is going to be amplified in the boiling point versus the melting point because there's going to take more energy to vaporize it. Um, so if you had two molecules, and maybe the hydrogen bond would account for a three or four degree difference in melting point, but it might be 10 or 12 or 15 degrees in the boiling point, simply because it takes more energy to do that. But in general, the higher the boiling point, the stronger the intermolecular forces, as long as the two molecules have the same molecular weight. So we can't compare a molecule that weighs 100 and a molecule that weighs 50. We've got to compare two molecules of the same molecular weight in order to determine how much the intermolecular force affects the physical properties. I have questions about, two questions about this. You wrote like a note that said there's a strong as Dipole, dipole? Yeah. They sound like the chart earlier. It looks like it was the second weakest. The dipole-dipole. Well, dipole-dipole dipole is the second strongest. The arrow is in every direction. Oh, there's a chart that they made. Oh. It's, it's pointing towards decreasing instead of pointing towards decreasing. Or something. Okay. Well, let's, let's just rank these. Let's rank the intermolecular forces then. Um... So what's the strongest? Well, okay, so so what's the strongest the strongest intermolecular force? Ionic, but the problem there is ions are molecules. So that's that's a technical problem that we have. So and then if we go to ion dipole, ions aren't molecules. So what I usually do is I start with hydrogen bonding. And I normally will say, okay, what's the, you know, what's the strongest intermolecular force? I'll say it's hydrogen bonding. And then next it would be dipole dipole. Now realizing that Hydrogen bonding is just a very specific type of dipole-dipole bonding. 
And then really the third one then is going to be dispersion. So for organic molecules, these are going to be our three choices for intermolecular forces. Hydrogen, the hydrogen bonding at the top and the dispersion at the bottom. So dipole dipole would be when you have two polar molecules. So you have to have molecules that have that are polar, that have permanent dipoles. And what does that mean? Well, let's say we take methanol. Okay. And if I said, is methanol a polar molecule? What you would want to do is you'd want to take this Lewis dot structure and you would want to probably convert it to something like a tetrahedral structure because the oxygen with the two lone pairs is a tetrahedral geometry. So oxygen would look like this with a hydrogen and with the CH3 group here and then with the lone pairs. And the way I'm drawing this molecule is to kind of give you a sense of the three-dimensional tetrahedron. So two bonds, these two bonds that are normal bonds, they're in the plane of the screen. This one is in front, the bold wedge, and then the dashed wedge is behind. <coughs> so this is a way we can represent the tetrahedron on a two-dimensional surface like the piece of paper or the board. So if I look at this molecule, and, and what I should really do then is I should take these hydrogens, and that CH3 is tetrahedral as well, so then I could write out those hydrogens in a tetrahedron. But the most important thing is, for a molecule to be polar, it needs two things. It needs at least one dipole, one polar covalent bond. So does this mo molecule have a polar covalent bond? Yes? It actually has how many? Do we agree with that? That it has two polar covalent bonds? Or so what a polar covalent bond is, is a bond where the two atoms have different electronegativities. And in reality, that's any two atoms that are attached that are different. Except carbon and hydrogen. Because carbon and hydrogen's electronegativity is so... Um, small the difference between them is so small like hydrogen is has an electronegativity of 2.1 and carbons is 2.4 and so it, the electronegativity difference there is really small so we call that a relatively nonpolar bond so if the two atoms are the same it's definitely a hundred percent nonpolar if it's a carbon hydrogen bond it's relatively nonpolar. So two atoms are the same or a CH bond are going to be nonpolar. Pretty much everything else is going to be polar covalent. So the only two electronegativities I have memorized, which they really aren't memorized, I just do them every year for the last 27 years, are carbon with 2.1 and, and hydrogen 2. Point, or hydrogen 2.1, carbon 2.4. If I had to guess at oxygen, it's somewhere in the threes. Like, how do you tell the difference when you're actually just by the type of By electronegativity. So carbon and hydrogen we're going to treat as nonpolar bonds. Carbon and, hydro carbon and oxygen are different, so that's a polar covalent bond. Which one's more electronegative? Oxygen or carbon? Okay, how do we know that? Well, if we're looking on the periodic table, we've got fluorine, we've got oxygen, we've got nitrogen, we've got carbon, and then fluorine, we've got uh, chlorine, 
bromine. Here's we've got a sulfur, a phosphorus. Hydrogen is like way over here. On the periodic table, then everything moves to fluorine. So oxygen's more electronegative than carbon. So that means that there would be, we could write a bond dipole that goes like this, where oxygen is slightly negative, carbon slightly positive. I'll try and draw that in there. Delta plus, the oxygen's delta minus. How about the oxygen hydrogen bond? Is it polar covalent? They're different. That's not CH. Which one's more electronegative there? Oxygen. So we could put our arrow that way and say the hydrogen is delta plus and the oxygen is delta minus. So how do you know if it's, if it's a polar covalent bond? Really, if the two atoms are different. They have to have a difference in electronegativity, but if it's long as it's not a CH, it's a polar covalent bond. Would you want us to also diagram the dipoles that go out because of the, the electron pairs as well? So, this is probably controversial from general chem. The electrons do not count when you draw bond dipoles. Because a bond dipole has to be a bond. So you don't draw arrows for the lone pairs. It's only for the atoms. And basically what we're looking for is this. Number one, you're, polar, you're a polar molecule if you have polar covalent bonds or one polar covalent bond. Secondly, you have to have a non-zero molecular dipole moment. And the molecular dipole moment would be the vector sums of these two arrows. In other words, in three-dimensional space, if you have two arrows that are going like this, the sum of those goes straight up and down. But we don't even have to get into that level of detail because basically as long as the molecule is not symmetrical, it's gonna as long as it has a polar covalent bond and it's not symmetrical, it will be a polar molecule. So here's what I mean by symmetrical. And apparently I added some stuff to the second half of the chapter, but for some reason, I think you have to refresh it in order to get it, or, yeah, I almost, it wasn't in the morning class, so it might be in you guys's. This is, it's strange because I have to deal with two books. Like when I make a change to one class's version of the book, chapter, I have to somehow move that to the other class. I wish I didn't have to do that, but I have to. So if I miss that, which I probably did in this case, somewhere in a book that's associated with this class, some version, I put in a CCL4 molecule with all the chlorines showing the same um, color, indicating that the molecule is nonpolar. I have to find that. But here's what I mean by symmetrical. What do we have? We have trigonal bipyramidal. We've got linear trigonal bipyramidal. We've got tetrahedral. We've got trigonal bipyramidal. And then we've got octahedral. If you have the same atoms on all those in in all of those positions for any of these structures the molecule is nonpolar if however you have lone pairs the lone pairs make the molecule automatically unsymmetrical so that it will be polar example ch h cl cl that 
molecule has polar covalent bonds because CCL. It is not symmetrical because it's got two chlorines and two hydrogens. And so the net dipoles would go like this, like this, like this, and like this. And you have to see in your head that it's tetrahedral. But basically, the net dipole would go like that. What's more important is these chlorines oops, are an area where there's electron extra electron density, so it's delta minus, and these hydrogens would be where there is a lack of electron density, and so they would be delta positive. So if I looked at the molecule, if I looked at this molecule with the um, bonds with the atoms shown in their delta plus delta minus colors, I would be able to see that this molecule has some blue for delta positive and some, uh, they use red for delta negative. And that's what it means to be a polar molecule, that your electron density on your surface is, has some positive and has some negative. Because what you're going to do is, as a polar covalent, or as a polar molecule, you're then going to say, well, my delta plus side and my delta minus side are then going to line up with the delta plus and delta minus side of another molecule. And it's that is the dipole-dipole interaction. So if you don't have a permanent dipole, you can't be a polar molecule. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? Is anybody, is everybody okay with that so far? I forget what the original question was before I got off on this topic. What was the original question? I don't know, you guys have one. Oh, real easy. Dipole dipole is two, is two polar molecules, which now we kind of have a general idea about iron. There's an ion in there. So there's a sodium, a chloride. The thing, in, the thing is in organic, we just don't have those right now. We just don't have metals. And so we're going to be talking about only molecules with non-metals from the upper right-hand por portion of the periodic table. So does that mean if you have ion, ion, or ion, therefore is an option, it's automatically wrong? No. It just means that if the molecule doesn't have any ions in it, yes, then it would be wrong. Um, This I cannot record on my computer. Well, I could. Uh, let's see, the light's better though. Okay. Let me take this off. Okay, so here's my. There's my dichloromethane, which is CH2Cl2. So there it is. And if I was to look at the electron density, and you have some pictures like this in your book, what you can see is the blue is positive and the red is negative, although in this case it's the yellow and the green that are negative. So what you see is the shading around this molecule is different. The two hydrogens are areas of delta plus, the two chlorines are areas of delta minus. So if I brought two of these together, the hydrogens would be attracted to the chlorines, and that would be the dipole-dipole interaction. Now, if I change this molecule, and let's say I make them um, all chlorines, 
So, so I'll make them all chlorines. Then here is my carbon tetrachloride. And we're going to get the naming next week. But let's, what you can see in this case is they all have the same color because they all are delta minus. So yes, this molecule does have polar covalent bonds, but they all cancel each other out so that there's no net dipole moment. But more importantly, there's no difference in the charge on the surface of the molecule. And so therefore, it's not polar. It's only polar if there's a difference in charge so that there's a delta positive on one area and a delta minus on the other, and that's how the molecules line up. So carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar. And so it's a, sol it's, a, it's a solvent that's been used, for instance, in dry cleaning. Because since it's a nonpolar solvent, it'll interact with the grease and oils very well. And it's got a lower boiling point, so you just basically wash the clothes with this. It cleans them, and then it's dry. It's like the acetone in lab. It evaporates really easily until it gets in the groundwater. It's in the ground, then the groundwater, and then it's poison. So that's why we've been moving away from that as a dry cleaning solvent. Now CO2 is a good dry cleaning solvent because it's nonpolar as well. You just have to make a liquid out of it. Okay. So does that kind of make sense? So I'm going a little farther than the original question, but that's okay. So that's dipole, so that's dipole, dipole. Hydrogen bonding is a, well, let me stop. Everybody okay? So these diagrams I wrote at the bottom. If every position has the same atom, the molecule will not be polar. It'll be nonpolar. Okay. If any one of those positions has a different atom or lone pairs, then the molecule is no longer nonpolar. It becomes polar. Would you be able to still form hydrogen bonds if, for instance, you had carbon in the middle and then you had a whole bunch of hydroxyl groups on the outside? Yes. But what, so if you wanted to draw a molecule like this, which isn't going to be feasible with off the same carbon, I don't think that one's been made yet which usually to a chemist means I can become famous if I make it. You're not going to become rich. You're just going to maybe become famous to other chemists. But if you could make that, and, the, and then you might say, well, why can't you make it? Because those oxygens are all pulling electron density out of the carbon. It, it doesn't have enough to satisfy everybody. But if you did that, what would make this mo molecule polar would not be the CO bonds. It would be the OH bonds. That's what would make it polar, because you'd have the oxygen in red and the hydrogen in blue. So that's what would make the molecule polar, not the CO bonds. Right. So in any of these geometries, and for instance, the tetrahedron on the oxygen, once I take my tetrahedron and put a couple lone pairs in there, and the other two atoms aren't the same, it becomes polar. So we really don't have to worry about sketching the dipole moment. Um, we just have to basically say, if you have any of these geometries, all the atoms are the same, it's nonpolar. Anything short of that, it's going to be polar, as long as that's a polar covalent bond. So there's no question where it was CH3 OH, and it said which is the liquid bond to have, and it says hydrogen, and it wasn't correct. So why okay. is... It would be hydrogen bonding. 
I don't know why it, why it would mark it wrong. For intermolecular forces, I would say two CH3OH molecules would have a hydrogen bond. So, so we can so we can do that. Does it make sense though about the symmetry? Because that's that's the easiest way to look at whether something's polar or nonpolar. And so the lone pairs don't draw, they don't create arrows, they don't create bond dipoles, but what they do is they make the molecule unsymmetrical, and that's what makes it polar. Okay. So the hydrogen bonding is a very special dipole-dipole bonding. And so I'm going to take a step back here and just give you this, this stupid analogy I use in general chemistry to sort of explain what hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole and all these intermolecular forces are about. So I usually say in general chemistry when we talk about Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law is the force between, it describes the force between two either positive or two same charged species or two opposite charged. If it's opposite charged, it's the attractive force. If it's the same charge, it's the repulsive force. It's based on the charges of the two things and the distance between them. So that to me is the most fundamental principle in chemistry because it explains a lot, including intermolecular forces. So if a space alien came down and said, I don't understand, we don't have chemistry in my world, How can what kind of world is that? That's a sad world if there's no chemistry. But I don't, what would be the most important thing that I need to know about chemistry? I would say it's Coulomb's law, which then would be a, that's a physics law, but it's okay. We can use it. So in terms of dipole, dipole, you have a fixed dipole with delta charges. The stronger the delta charges, the stronger the interactions are going to be. So if I want to take it to the most, what's the most positive and most negative delta charges that I can put in molecules? I go to the periodic table and I say, well, that means the atom is going to be attached to a hydrogen. And what are my three most electronegative elements? Fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. So when I put a fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen on a hydrogen, that makes the hydrogen the most positive it's going to be, and then that is the most negative it's going to be. So hydrogen bonds are nothing more than the most dipole, dipole interactions. They're the strongest. And we call them hydrogen bonds because hydrogen's in there. Now a hydrogen bond must... So if I had that CH3 molecule with the OH, methyl alcohol, and I had two of those, I might be able to write, I'd write the hydrogen bond maybe looking like this. And I could have this oxygen then be hydrogen bonded to another methanol. You know, you get the idea, that's how water is. But to have a hydrogen bond, the hydrogen needs to be covalently attached and hydrogen bonded attached to two atoms that are both either a nitrogen and oxygen or a fluorine. So like to clarify that, like you could have a hydrogen attached to an oxygen and you could also hydrogen bond to either a, nit a nitrogen or a fluorine. Like it can be anyway, is it like oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen? Yes. Okay. It, the hydrogen has to be in between two of two atoms that are one of those three. So this hydrogen is in between two oxygens. I could say, how about I change this to a CH3 <coughs> with an NH2 group, then that hydrogen for instance, in water, 
if I dissolve that molecule in water, it might look like this, where the hydrogens are hydrogen bonded to the oxygens of water. Maybe the nitrogen down here is hydrogen bonded to the hydrogen of water. But in each case, the hydrogen bond is in between an N, F, or O. They don't have to be the same, but they have to be one of those three elements. And what the biggest mistake I see here sometimes is that if I was to write out the structure of methanol as its Lewis dot structure like this, the hydrogens attached to the carbon cannot hydrogen bond. They can't hydrogen bond because they're not bonded to an O, an N, or an F. So that's what makes the that's what makes hydrogen bonding so much stronger than dipole dipole, because now I've got the greatest delta plus minus combination by making that element the most electronegative. And then of course in a dispersion, there is no permanent dipole moment. And there's a difference in that one because it would not be able to hydrogen bond with itself. Right, but it would be able to hydrogen bond in general. This one? Uh, yes. Uh, let me draw another molecule. So yes, it would be able to hydrogen bond with itself. Okay. But not through carbon. Okay. But not through carbon. So sometimes you'll see mixed molecules. It might say like, uh, here's a meth. What's the strongest intermolecular force that a methane molecule and a methanol molecule could undergo? And in that case, <laughs> it would be methane is a nonpolar molecule, methanol is a polar molecule, so that would be one of those induced dipole dipole forces that are kind of hybrid. And if we're looking at physical properties, if I took methane, which is a gas anyway, it's natural gas, and I put it into methanol, it's not going to dissolve. Because there's no intermolecular forces for it to connect with. So in terms of force strength, then, I only deal with three, hydrogen, dipole, dipole, and dispersion, with hydrogen being number one, dipole number two, and dispersion number three. But in order to get to answering that question, we need to know if the molecule is polar. And to make sure that the molecule is polar, we need to not only have a Lewis dot structure for it, but we then need to have a Vesper geometry. Is everybody okay with that? Bored by that? Were there any other? Wait, like dissolves like, I wasn't really sure. Are we not allowed to use that? Or is that not like accurate for everything anymore? Like dissolves like. That's our standard answer for what? That's our standard answer for why things dissolve. It's always that like dissolves like. And then I usually say like like what? Meaning what what does like refer to? It needs to be polar and dull. Well what is when it says like dissolves like, what is that what are the what are the like things we're talking about? Or what's the like property we're talking about? Is it polar, non polar, so 
Okay, but but really more specifically, the intermolecular forces that that molecule is going to undergo, because if you really want to go if you really want to go down and get into the nitty gritty details of why things dissolve, we need to look at energies. I mean, chemistry is about energy. You know, if you want to know what why things happen in politics, you follow the money. That's the standard. That's the standard line. And probably now, as you follow power, Lord only knows what it is nowadays. But in chemistry, it's about energy. So if I want to dissolve my ionic substance in water, I have to think about this process is, I, how much energy is it going to take me to bust those ions apart? It's going to take a lot, right? Because that's an ion-ion interaction. Then, how much energy is it going to take me to bust the water molecules apart? Well, that's hydrogen bonding, so that's going to be a lot of energy too. Will I get that energy back, or close, if I take my water and my ion and I bring them together? And so, is an ion dipole force going to provide the same amount of energy from stabilizing as I need to bust those two things apart? And the answer is yes, because we know if we take salt and put it in water, it dissolves. We put other substances in, they may get hot or they may get cold, but that's just, they're close. So we have to make sure that the intermolecular forces that we form in the solution are the same, or roughly the same amount as what it takes to break the two molecules apart. So it's a little more detailed than that. So really when we look at a nonpolar substance, let's, let's say we have a nonpolar solvent and a nonpolar substance, right? So when you were cleaning out your glassware in lab, and you were squirting in the acetone, this is essentially what you were doing. You were dissolving the organic, the nonpolar material. So it doesn't take a lot of energy to break nonpolar molecules apart because they're dispersion. It doesn't take a lot of energy to, to, to break the solvent molecules apart because they're, if they're nonpolar, they're dispersion. What do I get back when I bring the two molecules together? I get dispersive interactions everything's about the same. So two nonpolar molecules dissolve because their like is that they both undergo dispersion intermolecular forces. I then try and do this with an organic molecule with a nonpolar molecule in water. Does it take a lot of energy to break the nonpolar solvent apart? No, that's dispersion. Does it take a lot of energy to break the water molecules apart? Yes, because that's hydrogen bonding. When my nonpolar molecule and my water molecule come together and I have my, di my induced dipole, dipole force, is that enough to make up for the breaking of the water molecules? No. So the reason that a nonpolar solvent doesn't dissolve, a solid doesn't dissolve in water is because the resulting solution doesn't have enough energy to break the water molecules apart. So it's just a different way of looking at the solution process. But if you want to know, you know, you have to go into the, the gory details. So the like dislike is great, but it's not the most accurate measurement or most accurate explanation, I guess. Anything else on intermolecular forces? There's a question that it said um, it dissolves completely, or like high visibility versus moderate visibility and like low visibility. How do we know if it's moderate versus high? Um, I think in, in those cases, high visibility might involve like a hydrogen bond. 
um, or the forces, the molecules are like perfectly matched. So like two molecules that can hydrogen bond versus a polar molecule and a hydrogen bonded molecule maybe. I don't know what I don't know what their rules are. So to me things are either miscible or not miscible. They either dissolve or they don't dissolve. I mean if they partially dissolve, our best case of that is sometimes you can get a nonpolar to dissolve in a dipole in a polar molecule that doesn't hydrogen bond, like acetone that doesn't hydrogen bond, and maybe the stuff you had in lab might dissolve because they're approximately the same, but not exactly the same intermolecular forces. So in lab, and we're skipping this part next week in lab, so that we could, in th so Thursdays people could get through. But in my, where I had hydrogen bonding dipole and nonpolar, if you're like just a dipole-dipole molecule, you might be able to dissolve a hydrogen bonding one. You might also be able to dissolve a nonpolar molecule because you're like in between. So that might be moderate miscibility. Anything on Lewis dot structures or resonance? Do you know where bonds were? Bond order. So bond order is basically whether it's single or double bonded, which is easy enough in a regular molecule but in a resonance hybrid is where we would sometimes talk about the bond order. So How did you do? Now that I drew all three, did everybody get at least one of the three? Did you get more than one of the three? Did you get these three? Okay. So then in terms of charges, this has a plus one, this has a minus one, this has a minus one, this has a plus one. So when we do resonance structures, if we're talking about bond order, we're talking about first uh, one, two, and three, whether it's a single, a double, or a triple. Now, sadly, with this molecule, if I averaged all three of these structures out, I would get the first one. So these are three resonance structures, but the resonance hybrid is going to look an awful lot like the one on the left. Dave? Yes, and then both these ones would have the negative one. Just, just checking. Everybody said they got the same structure. Yeah, the middle nitrogen always has the plus one. Always has the plus one charge. Or hold on, let's do these from scratch. You tell me. This is what happens when I rush. Minus, this is, these, these are all plus ones in the middle. And then the triple bonded nitrogen is what? Zero. Zero, and then the nitrogen with the three lone pairs is minus two. Yeah, there we go. So what I originally wrote wasn't like yours. Okay, now we're good. So the, prob the problem with the middle and the right one is they have the same energy. They are not the same because I'm not allowed to move atoms in resonance structures. 
So the middle and the right one are different, but energetically they have the same energy. So if I averaged all three, all three of these together, I'm going to get something that looks like the middle. That's going to be the resonance hybrid. Now, sometimes we end up with a resonance hybrid of something that might look like, that might have a partial, like, double bond there, and maybe then um, maybe a maybe like a part. Well, we can't do that. That's bad. But it, maybe you have a molecule like that has a partial double bond in the resonance hybrid. That means that molecule has a bond order between one and two. When I'm doing these, when I'm doing these structures. And actually, the resonance hybrid of this molecule would look like it would look like this. If you averaged all three of them, you would have a plus one here, a delta minus there, and a delta minus there. The reality is the two delta minuses are both minus one. But I'm not concerned about, in a resonance hybrid, I'm not concerned about the exact charge. I'm concerned about where the partial charges are. And I'm also concerned that the bond is somewhere between first and second order. And so that's where that term comes into play. And what I may do is I may, have, I may for Wednesday, come up with some um, sort of take-home quiz of some of these to give you um, some of the problems, sort of the catch-up of chapter one, and one of them I would give you a, a structure and say, write this many resonance structures, write the hybrid, and you may end up with something like that. So you'd say it's between first and second order. Okay, so um, there apparently was a problem that this morning that if I set the problems due for one o'clock, then if you went online to look for the problems, they were gone. So I made the problems, I took away the deadline for the problems. Now if you realized, I can only set a deadline for problems in a chapter, for the whole chapter. So when I say, you know, do the problems for chapter two's reading from 2.1 to 2.5, if you don't do some of them, there's no penalty because you have until the entire end of the chapter for those problems. So just keep that in mind if you want to bring that question in and ask it. So for, for Wednesday, um, the homework problems in experiment or in chapter one are going to be due. They do not have a deadline but I will download them after class. Download your scores. So that's the deadline. Um, and then the reading. And Monday and Wednesdays is gonna be about naming um, alkanes. And so this is gonna be new for everybody. So I expect everybody to just kind of come in like, whoa, what was that? And it's fine, we, we will go over it if I have to lecture go back through that, but see what you can pick up from the reading and the problems. I've added a bunch of notes. Um, and the last thing is, uh, somebody said this morning, well, I now the book this year and last year really different, so I'm, I've got to go like a week ahead and pull everything back. Uh, that's what I'm going to find out this weekend.